it's a bit of an odd expression. Um, I mean, you know, before we had this one half mv squared, which was nice and simple. This expression actually raises a question that you didn't probably think to ask before we had this expression. So this is the result we ended the, this derivation with. And it does come down to, you know, if we didn't follow all of the derivation, it does come down to the similar justification as momentum. The result is uh, a lot simpler than the derivation is, and it's a lot more useful. Um, now, it maybe it doesn't look as simple as this did. Um, so let me try to justify it in two ways. Um, let's see. One is I can show you that the low speed limit of this expression is what you are already familiar with. So I want to take the limit. Um, so I, this is what I want to show. I want to show that limit as, uh, as a velocity goes to zero or limit as gamma goes to one of this expression here, gamma minus one mc squared, is somehow surprisingly equal to one half mv squared. Like right now it doesn't look it, right? Um, maybe it'll look more like it once I write out what gamma is in terms of v. So let's try that. So if I write out gamma in terms of v, what that looks like is one over um, square root of one minus v squared over c squared minus one times mc squared. Does that look like equal to that? When you take the limit v going to zero? Not quite exactly, right? Because you get kind of an indeterminate expression. So if v was exactly equal to zero, then um, you know it's one minus one, zero. Well, if v is exactly zero, zero is equal to zero. Yeah, at, when v is equal to zero, they are agreeing with each other. But where that leaves you, you see, it's a little bit unsatisfactory. So like, what if v is equal to one meter per second? <laughs> are they still equivalent to each other? So um, let me, so you can actually do this the proper way. You can do Taylor polynomial, you can, do it the way you would do it in a method 3B. Uh, let me take a bit of a shortcut. This is a lot better justified than the other shortcut I took. Um, so let me rewrite this into this form, which is also equivalent to it. It's actually the same thing I did over there. Instead of writing as square root whatever, I'm writing it as one minus of v squared over c squared raised to power of minus one half. People have seen that? Yes, how many, yes, uh, right? This is the same thing as what I just erased, right? Now, this is what I want to ask. How many here have seen something called a binomial approximation? This is a very common approximation. It can, you can do when you have an expression of this form. One plus a small number that's much less than one raised to the power of I guess n, but it can really be x, because this does not need to be an integer. It can be any real number. It can be a complex number. <laughs> so when you have an expression of this form, but the binomial, express, binomial approximation is one, oh, so it's uh, approximately equal to one plus x times epsilon. Let me not do x, sorry. Let me just keep it as n. Uh, it's weird to sing x that way n times e epsilon. And if you want to go further, you can actually go one step further. It would be uh, n times n minus 1 divided by 2 factorial epsilon squared plus, and then it keeps on going. How many people here have seen this? You have? Yeah, if you've seen it, great. If not, you can actually prove this using Taylor polynomial. You just take, a polyno take the Taylor polynomial of this using this as the variable. Good. So the fact I want to use is this portion. I don't really need the second and the further terms. I only need it up to the linear term. So using this binomial approximation, I want to rewrite this into the approximate form in the limit where epsilon or v squared over c squared is much less than one. So in that limit, this is what this uh, parenthesis thing is approximately equal to. 
it's one times, oh, sorry, one plus the thing that's on the exponential, minus one half times the thing that's epsilon, that would be minus v squared over c squared, minus v squared over c squared. Fortunately, the minuses cancel, right? Um, and then minus one. So let me keep the same color, minus one. Does something cancel? Yeah, these two minuses cancel, uh, sorry, ones cancel, right? One canceled out by minus one. So these two cancel somehow, fortunately. And when you imagine taking this, multiplying it to mc squared, the c squared, which you had here and you don't have here, actually cancels out. So you have 1 half mv squared is equal to 1 half mv squared. So this expression that we are claiming is true for all values of gamma is also correct as gamma goes to 1. Or correct, uh, it's, uh, it agrees <laughs> with the low speed approximation that we have been using. Yeah. Okay, so that's one way of justifying it. And um, there's a principle in uh, physics, uh, it's called the correspondence principle. It's uh, the idea that in physics, even when a newer theory of physics invalidates something that you know now, what you know now is not incom it's not perfect, <laughs> it's not completely incorrect. The science we are doing now is different from the science, uh, the physics that Aristotle was doing. Aristotle didn't do any experiment of any kind. He was just thinking of things in his head. When he was completely wrong, he had no way of knowing that. The kind of science we do now, it's grounded in experiments. Maybe the, the scope of its application is narrower than what we think it is, but what we know to be true is it's at least true all, um, in the range we have tested it. So this is at least correct for low speed applications. So whatever new theory of physics comes along has to still reduce down to this in the limit where we know the correct approximations. So it's called the correspondence principle. It applies to special relativity, applies to quantum mechanics. And whatever new law of physics we discover in the future, it'll continue to apply. Because it makes logical sense, right? What we think are correct now are not just something we made up. It's something we tested against the experiment. So when we have a true world theory of physics, it'll continue to reduce down to the same expression in the range where we already tested it. 